Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Jamie Wu. I am the co-founder of Incident Labs. Uh, we build uh, tooling to help engineering and infrastructure managers do their jobs uh, easier and better. Uh, and I am a proud DigitalOcean alumnus. Uh, it was amazing being part of DO and being able to see all the developers building on top of the platform, and it definitely helped inspire me to get kind of bit by the startup bug and go off and try my own thing. Uh, this talk is called, Yes, You Can Improve Your Team's Wellness. This is something that uh, over the course of my career in tech, I've seen is you know, with all of the kind of needs that are on top of developers, we don't always think about the human element of it. We're very uh, aware and very mindful of how our systems are doing, but don't always think about how our people are doing. And so today, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So let's start off with a story, okay? Um, the first time that I became a manager in an official capacity, you know, that way, what I mean is that it was in my title. I kind of low-key freaked out. You know, it's a really big responsibility having people report into you. And at the time, I wouldn't trust myself really taking care of a plant, let alone managing a team. I think first-time managers can really relate to that feeling. Uh, luckily, you know, I followed the school of thought to always surround myself with people who are smarter than me. So I called up every friend I knew with management experience and asked them, for advice. And so the thing I'd ask is, well, how can I be a successful manager? Yeah, you know, I wanted to do well. I grew up in an immigrant Asian household, so passable wasn't good enough. I really wanted to excel. And I got so much useful advice around listening and trusting myself and managing upwards. Um, and there was one piece of advice that really, really stuck with me. And it's the one that actually I pass on whenever I get asked about how to be a successful manager. That advice is to reduce ambiguity and remove roadblocks, which, you know, to be honest, back then, it kind of surprised me because I thought being a manager was about directing people. You know, I, I guess maybe that's what a, a, someone with a title of director does. Uh, but this felt almost like stage setting, right? Like, what does that even mean to kind of be almost in the, the background, just shuffling things around. Uh, but in my brain, you know, this advice meant help people understand the direction and then remove whatever might slow them down. And, you know, reading that, it, it became clearer that this is really what a successful leader does. You know, they, they remove the obstacles so that their team can move forward as fast as they can in a, in a healthy way. So you might be asking then, wait a second, great, thank you for the advice. What does it have to do with wellness? Why should I be thinking about this at the same time? The reason is we have to think of structural factors. Okay, like how I thought management should look like, as in telling people what to do, we actually often fall into that trap around team wellness as well. You know, that the fix, if there is one, is by getting more out of people rather than thinking about how the environment around them supports or doesn't support them. Thinking about the system and its effect is what this talk is all about. So who is this talk for? You know, because I know I started this presentation uh, talking about managers. And you're like, well, what if I'm not a manager right now, or what if I don't have aspirations to be a manager? Will this talk apply to me? Absolutely. This is for everyone. If you lead a team, if you're on a team, if you're not on a team, because the science here, and that's the cool thing, right? There's actually going to be science and there's going to be applicable stuff here. It applies throughout our life. The really, really amazing thing is you're going to find that this maybe even applies outside of work. Actually, I guarantee it because I, I use this stuff outside of work. Um, now, what do I mean by wellness? Okay, how do we think about work-related stress? Okay, so mood, satisfaction, stress, burnout. And I put work with an asterisk because the pandemic has really changed our very notion of what work looks like. You know, The Verge's Casey Newton tweeted something that was you know, quite interesting. He said, we're not working from home. 
we are living at work. And when we think about how we approach work, really we've always approached it from a office point of view for most companies. Now, DigitalOcean is quite distributed and quite remote, so there's a lot of thoughtfulness there. Okay, what does it look like if people are working from home? But for many people, this is a, a new experience. Uh, and just a little bit more about myself. You know, I started with a bit of an intro, but I've been researching this space for three years now. I'm really deeply interested in this stuff. I think we can do better. So this is why I care about this stuff. I actually started out, I studied biomedical engineering and I was a molecular biologist. Um, and so for me, I'm always like, okay, where's the research? Show me the research, show me the papers, you know, show me what people have. Don't just see, look at one thing and then all of a sudden think that, that you know, pop science is the facts show me how this is done so this is what you should know you know when you're hearing this this is based on years of research this is not just one paper that came out uh, and i'm a huge advocate for mindfulness and mental health it really has helped me in my journey to be more aware of how i think and how i approach my own mental health and to really you know even be like hey this is something that's worthwhile putting all this time toward um, but with that said, I'm, I'm not a doctor. This is not medical advice. Um, you know, I, I encourage you to pursue this on your own and find stuff. Um, but I do think our baseline can be increased quite a bit from where it is right now. So let's start with an intention. Okay, today we are going to dive into the research around work-related stress to learn about how it affects mental health and apply some ideas from our industry toward improving working conditions for our coworkers and for ourselves. Because this is the cool thing, you know, there's actually some things that you already do around your systems that maybe you could start doing uh, to improve kind of the wellness of your team. Let's start with a snapshot, because I think that um, sometimes when we talk about stress, it can kind of feel amorphous. People don't necessarily, um, well, you know, everyone gets stressed or how bad can it be? Or maybe, you know, is it being overblown or, or is it just some people who can't handle it? There's a lot of questions that we kind of ask around mental health um, that I want to definitely touch on before we go. So this is from the American Psychological Association's 2016 Work and Wellbeing Survey. Okay. And overall, most employees say they are in good psychological health. You know, this is across a broad range of industries, a lot of different people. However, nearly one in six say mental health problems made job challenges more difficult to handle. Okay. And the four questions up here, because it, it might not be that easy to see are during my work day, I typically feel tense or stressed out. Uh, during my work day, I experience physical symptoms such as shortness of breath, dizziness, muscle spasms, headaches, and neck stiffness. Uh, in the past month, the challenges of my job were harder to handle because of the mental health problems such as depression, anxiety, or other medical health issues. Uh, and in the past month, mental health problems such as uh, depression, anxiety, or other mental health issues kept me from achieving my work. Now, these numbers do not mean that developers would answer the same. But rather, I wanted to paint a picture that this is something worth discussing because it is widespread. And that was during 2016. We are in a much more challenging uh, environment and climate than we were back then. And so it's to say that if you have felt these things, you are not alone. You know, it is not just uh, a matter of were you strong enough or, um, you know, what if you just tried harder? This is something we have to think about as a broad uh, issue and that it is more than just someone's ability to individually cope. I mean, but stress in a dev's life? <laughs> no, no, that can't happen. Um, what's been really interesting is in addition to the uh, actual work that a developer needs to do, times are changing, right? What we're seeing is uh, there really is this need for more availability. We are, you know, more and more developers are responsible for their own code. And what that means is that more and more developers are going on call. And even if you're not, um, there are expectations now for how software 
uh, get supported and also the increasing pace of software it means that this is a industry that we have to really think about these things and start kind of facing it because instead of just having that kind of uh, knee jerk reaction of, well, why should we care about this? Let's take a look actually um, at one segment of developers, a uh, site reliability engineers. And so they deal with an incident response. And uh, this is from a, a catch point 2018 report looking at stress. How does, how do incidents affect responders? and more and more developers are going on call and having to face incidents. Well, 79% of survey respondents felt stress after incidents. So that's four out of five developers. And 69% of respondents felt moderate or high stress. So of that, that, that is more than just your everyday work stress. Uh, half said that it affected their mood half said that it affected their concentration. So we can start seeing how this is a bit of a vicious cycle, right? Because you have an incident, you get really stressed, it affects your mood and concentration. You're not able to do the things that you normally do. And that creates its own form of stress, which kind of, you know, creates the cycle. Four in 10 said it affected their sleep. Uh, and, and I don't know how all of you are doing, but I, I haven't had good sleep, I'd say, maybe in the last six months. So you add additional stress on top of that and sleep is so important. Um, and four in 10 said it affected their ability to be social, which again right now is, is just so crucially important. And why this matters is that if this was just something that happened in the short term and then it you know, went away and everyone rebounded back to the norm, that's great. But research has shown that personal well-being significantly predicted not only contemporaneous employee performance, so performance right now, but also subsequent supervisory performance ratings several years in the future. So this is not just an investment in right now. This is an investment in the future. These things have an impact which are, I think, much bigger and uh, much more long-term than people can expect. Now, what can we do about this? What was so interesting diving into the research is that there is actually a recipe for stress. And once you learn this, it unlocks kind of our approach to stress. It's really quite fascinating. Uh, the CSHS has discovered that there are four ingredients in the recipe for stress. And not every single one of the ingredients uh, will always be present, but at least one will be. And you can even have a combination of more than one. What are the recipe? Uh, what are the ingredients? So the four are novelty. So is something new to you? Have you experienced it before? So if you think of it, when we go to a new neighborhood, even if we know that it's a pretty safe, reputable neighborhood, newness introduces stress. And sometimes it's not even about your safety. It's like, okay, will I be accepted here? Or will I get lost? Newness is an ingredient for stress. Unpredictability. Uh, is there any way that you knew that this would occur? So sometimes even when we're doing the same old stuff, let's say... Um, all of a sudden, a, a, a cat rushes by you or a bird flies by. That's very unpredictable. And that causes stress because then we don't really have a grounding of what's going to happen around us. Threat to the ego. So your competence as a person is put into question. Uh, if you felt uh, stressed in a meeting or public speaking, that's partly because you're, you're feeling like what if people – don't really connect with what I'm saying? What if they think lesser of me because of it? You know, giving this presentation, it's, it's a bit vulnerable because what if you reject what I'm saying? What if you hear what I'm saying go, mm, this guy doesn't really know what he's talking about. I'm not interested. In fact, I think worse of him because he gave this, uh, this presentation. That's a very stressful idea for ourselves that there's a threat to the ego. Lastly, sense of control. So this is a little bit different because, well, even, you know, with, with any kind of like online conference, okay, what if, what if the connectivity goes down? What if there's an outage? What if something happens? How do we make sure that we have a sense of control over the situation? And certainly, you know, over the last six months, we've seen 
a lack of control. I, uh, how do we protect our families? How do we protect ourselves? How do we protect our livelihoods? Losing that sense of control is deeply stressful for us. Um, and so what you can actually do is next time that you're stressed about something, you can sit there and go, wait, which of the four ingredients are here? And it kind of gives you an idea of, okay, how do I then uh, reinstate a sense of control? How do I kind of make sure to help myself not think that I'm going to be, you know, my, my competence will, will be put into question. It's a different way of kind of approaching stress versus just being like, I'm stressed. We can kind of go, oh, oh, I didn't expect this. That's why I'm feeling so stressed. It's actually quite empowering. Uh, now, now that we kind of know what stress is like, how do we de-stress? Okay, so normally when we talk about de-stressing, we go, all right, go take some vacation. Um, so I, I'm, this is actually a background of Tucson, uh, a sunset in Tucson. I, I don't live in Tucson, but definitely it's a very you know, nice place to visit and I enjoy it. So, you know, I plan on going back there hopefully soon, and take a vacation, de-stress a little bit. Mindfulness, like we've talked about, it's, there's a lot of proven research about its ability to help with stress. Uh, meditation, you know, on a related note, Exercise is really, really important. Um, the ability is you can go for a walk or um, find some way to kind of uh, give the body some kind of you know, physical movement. Controlled breathing. So this one was so interesting that even just breathing properly, okay, just actually another mention. So breathing properly will actually help physiologically reset the system. So actually, why don't we try something right now? Okay, uh, no one can see you. So, you know, you can do this or not do this. And um, if you, you know, think you might look silly, there's no one here. No one can see you do this. So you can give it a try. We're going to take 10 deep breaths, okay? Um, and if anytime you don't want to do it anymore, don't. If midway through you want to join, great. But let's, let's give it a try, right? Why not? Okay. through the nose, breathe out through the mouth. Really feel that air going into your lungs. Okay, we're at four. Feels longer than you'd expect, right? I'm at six right now, so let's do four more. I've been sitting up a little bit. Last one. All right, how did that feel? It's kind of interesting how just taking that time to breathe, you know, we kind of assume breathing is something that we all do. So why would we need to put some focus on or why do we need to think about it? Um, but if that did help, you know, if you can kind of feel your body almost relax a bit, there's a fantastic New York Times article on how to do controlled breathing. Um, and anytime you feel stressed, I do recommend just taking 10 breaths and seeing how you feel after. Uh, sleeping better that's a great way to also de-stress our body is really you know less than uh, six hours for most people um, puts our bodies into a, a stressful state uh, and therapy you know we we're thankfully we're now more open about talking about therapy um, but definitely it's still something that's not that financially accessible to everyone and it can still have a lot of connotations for people um, but those are the traditional ways we talk about it oh and I forgot listening to Beyonce. You know, the, the, I, I don't know how many research papers are on this, but this is my gut. I, I think that listening to Beyonce is very helpful. 
empaths. You know, that's that's my dog Taco, and uh, definitely having pets. If, if you have any around you, you can see that they're fantastic for helping you kind of stay in the moment and de-stress. Now, those are fantastic things, but they also kind of give this wrong message, which is, hey, just be stronger. Now, I have no problem with any of these techniques. I use a lot of them. But the problem is they kind of say, hey, okay, you, when stress happens to you, you get stronger, okay? You figure this out. You, you do these things and get better, and then come back to do work. The thing is, there's more to the story, okay? So in this uh, report that was actually, I believe, done for the WHO, um, this is a great quote, many workplaces have opted for attempting to enhance their workers' resilience rather than modifying risk factors. Think about that, okay? Have you internalized the idea that things are going wrong? It's probably your fault. You know, or holding within your control to fix. Do you assume, as many of us do, to not think at the team or organizational level because, well, why bother? What this tells us is that we have to widen our scope to truly understand and affect the system. Okay? Research shows that situational and organizational factors play more of a role in the workplace than individual ones. This is from some of the researchers who really helped us understand burnout and launched all the you know, field study around it. We focus on the individual because of our ideas of individual causality and responsibility, right? It's on you. You go and do these things to de-stress. It's in your power. That's part of the story. But this is the very important thing. The assumption is that it's easier and cheaper to change people rather than organizations. Think about that, all right? We think, hey, it's better to just try to get everyone to do yoga or meditate. That's how they'll fix it. And the research tells us actually better to try to fix the organization and the factors that play in the environment. That's actually a better way to make change happen. So what are these situational and organizational factors? Okay, so here's a model looking at the three main ones related to job-related stress and importantly how they interrelate. We can see here that the three main categories are occupational uncertainty. So how does your job look like on the day to day? Do you have an understanding of it? Is your job even secure? Uh, and you've got lack of value and respect in the workplace here. Obviously anyone who has worked somewhere where they feel like they are uh, undervalued or disrespected understands how it plays a role in stress. And lastly, imbalanced job design. You know, what is going on with the job where it, um, you know, things are all over the place or it doesn't really feel like you, you thought you understood the role, but you kind of don't. How does this complexify our ideas around stress? Well, by acknowledging the how a job and how work culture are designed, whether intentional or not, directly has a role in work-related stress. And we can't keep relying on individuals to do all the heavy lifting. We've tried right? I mean, all these ideas of, you know, fancy perks and yoga and meditation, we've been trying this and it doesn't seem to be the cure. So how do we fix this? We have to do this because the consequences are uh, too costly. Okay, let's think about burnout. What does burnout look like? You know, there for a lot of people, you know, we talk about burnout, but there's actually a, a clinical kind of description of burnout. So I want to talk about that. Exhaustion, cynicism, chronic negative responses. You know, if you hear someone who always seems to see the negative side of things, they're probably experiencing burnout. Like, that, that doesn't seem like them normally or wow, even happy things. They seem to come back with a negative kind of lens on it. It's probably because they're experiencing burnout and ineffectiveness. They're not able to do the things that they need to do. Um, 
And I guess when I'm looking at this, like, let's be frank, no one wants these feelings. Most people want to do a good job. They don't want to feel burnt out. And burnout affects job satisfaction, which then ties into performance. You know, and if we have to kind of put a number to it, uh, one study suggests that work-related stress and burnout costs America an estimated $300 billion loss in productivity a year. That's huge, right? And we're asking people to try to take that on themselves. All right, so what are some common factors for burnout? How does this happen? Well, you can have work overload. So your job demands exceed human limits. Uh, lack of control, inability to influence decisions that affect your job, insufficient rewards, you know, insufficient financial institution, uh, institutional or social rewards. And if you're looking at these, there's six in total. So there's another slide with three more. But um, kind of starting to see, like, hey, wait a second. This kind of reminds us of the ingredients of stress, right? There's a bit of that overlap that's going on. The remaining through a breakdown of community, so an unsupportive workplace environment. Absence of fairness, the so lack of fairness in decision-making processes. Uh, and value conflicts, you know, mismatch in organizational value and the individual's values. And so many of these have threads to our sense of the world we live in and our ability to be seen, heard, and play a role within it. You know, we can map them back to our ingredients for stress. Um, and the two I think that you should really think about are threat to ego and sense of control. You know, those are very personal things and we can get affected by it. Now, another really fascinating way that I started to think about burnout was because of my friend Denise Yu. And she wrote, uh, she contributed an essay on burnout sustainability for a uh, collection of essays that uh, I co-edited and co-curated called 97 Things Every SRE Should Know. So uh, it should be, I believe it's out on early access on O'Reilly right now, um, or if not, it's coming up very soon. And it's just so fascinating. There's some really great ideas in there. Uh, and for her essay, you know, she was doing some reading of her own on burnout. She came across a great talk uh, that was discussing burnout. But I, for everything I'd read, I'd never thought of it this way. You know, I, it's caused by unresolved feedback loops. So think about it. Life is all about feedback loops. You know, if you do something, either things are better or worse, and you kind of say, okay, I've got a new data point. Now I know what I can do with it. How I started to think about it was burnout is sometimes when the signal is too weak or diluted because of too much noise, you don't really know where to go next, or it takes too long. You're not really getting some sense of what's happening. And so you're almost in a holding pattern waiting to see what happens. And when I start to think about, you know, at work, all the different feedback loops that happen, this is another way to start thinking about it. Okay, what unresolved feedback loops do we have? Do, do people know, do they have a strong sense of the world that they're in? And if not, how do we help them? Now, why does this matter? Because... We have to realize that researchers believe that emotions are contagious, that like catching a cold as social animals, we tend to catch the emotions of people around us. And the effect appears higher between a manager and a report. And this rings true, right? We've had leaders who've inspired us and we've had leaders who've demotivated us. And the amplified effect is likely explained by the fact that they directly influence what your job means and what your sense of self is. So, at the same time, emotional contagion includes both happiness and sadness. So there's a silver lining there, okay? Negative emotions can lower morale and productivity, but positive emotions can have benefits such as improving employee cooperation, satisfaction, and performance. And so one model of emotional contagion looks at three factors. Interpersonal factors, trust. Individual factors, empathy and contextual factors, which looks at kind of leadership and job design, which relates to kind of that model that I showed with the Venn diagrams before around burnout. And these all contribute to the level of emotional contagion, which then affects team effectiveness. So there's a lot going on, but I think one of the really kind of optimistic things is yes, this seems like holy, there's a lot going on here, but it means also some of this is mapped out. So we truly care about trying to do this, the information is here ready for us to kind of pick apart and to reflect on. 
So why is this specific to developers? And I think it's partly because of the idea of hero syndrome or, or martyr syndrome. There's lots of different names for it, where we kind of believe in this idea of the lone wolf software developer who can go out there and save things. Maybe they have before, and they're going to you know kind of throw themselves on the sword for this. Um, part of the problem is that multiple studies have found people who are less likely to discuss their emotional state are actually more emotionally contagious, okay? We have to acknowledge that people may not feel comfortable talking about what's going on, but also we have to know then that, um, unfortunately, there's an impact of that. So what does this all have to do, you know, what am I going to do with all this information? I go very much back to the advice that I got on how to be a successful manager. You know, to really improve team wellness, we need to reduce ambiguity and we need to remove roadblocks. These seem to be important parts of stress and burnout, uh, which then can get exacerbated by emotional contagion. So what we want to do is have an understanding of what's going on so that people can then, you know, take the measures that they need to also improve their own wellness. The same with the idea of monitoring, right? I mean, most, uh, I hope, you know, most developers are monitoring their systems. Uh, how often are we monitoring, you know, our teams? And not monitoring as a surveillance, but really just asking them how things are going. How often is feedback happening? You know, would you monitor your system only once or twice a year? How do you know what your well-being climate is like when you don't have feedback tools? Are you measuring uh, acutely and also long-term? What are your levels of psychological safety? How blame-aware is your company? You know, we talk about these things. Uh, and, and if you're not uh, clear about any of these terms, feel free to ask me afterwards. I'm happy to answer questions about them. Uh, but then we don't find ways to capture and measure them. I want to bring in this really interesting concept from site reliability engineering. It's called TOIL. TOIL is defined uh, by Google as the repetitive, predictable, constant streams of tasks related to maintaining a service. Uh, so think about uh, a real life example would be thinking about doing the dishes, right? You have to do them. And if you're going to create more meals or you're going to have more people over or you want to try different dishes, you're going to create more dishes. You can't really optimize this. I mean, I, I guess you could, you could um, serve right on the table if you wanted to. Uh, but in this example, you know, you're going to use dishes. And then after you've done the dishes, you have to wash them. You got to put them away to reset the system back to normal so you can do it again. This is toil. This is toil work. It exists in all of our jobs. And in SRE, it's actually really important to think about how much toil is happening. And if there's too much toil happening, what can you automate and what can you remove? Because toil, I mean, no one likes doing the dishes, right? We automate it with the dishwasher. I actually, I, I strangely like doing other people's dishes. Uh, maybe it's because then it means I'll be invited back for another you know, dinner or something. Uh, I don't like doing my own dishes, but I like doing other people's dishes. Um, so maybe, you know, the answer is doing other people's toil. I'm kidding. Uh, but we need to think about toil. So one thing that at LinkedIn, uh, Kurt Anderson of LinkedIn gave a presentation at Lisa where they did a toil survey so that they can have an understanding of what toil looks like in their day to day. And um, this includes doing a time matrix. So they broke down all the different, you know, how are they working on their time? What's toil happening? Uh, you know, how can they try to solve that? And what we can do then is we can kind of remove some of the kind of stressful things because Google has really said that too much toil leads to stress, it leads to burnout, it leads to um, attrition. And so that's one practical way we can try to improve our team's wellness. How do we get rid of some of this toil? Now, let's return to our recipe for stress, right? We've talked about novelty, unpredictability, threat to ego, and sense of control. Well, what if we actually tried to transform that feedback into action? Okay, what if uh, we took a look at anytime there was something stressful going on and we said, okay, which ones is it? You know, which of these ingredients? And then how could we mitigate that? So for this, the kind of like uh, most um, 
close, you know, or the, the most uh, relevant example for a lot of people can be incidents. You know, if you're solving incidents or you have to resolve them. Um, if it was very new, does it mean there needs to be more training? Do you need to spend more time just getting people familiar with incident response? Um, do you need to do something called game days so you can actually practice the motions of it? Or do you want to do some chaos experiments so you can kind of um, understand how the system works? By breaking down stressful moments into these four parts, you can actually start thinking through what is it? Is it that, you know, sometimes it's cultural. What if I'm responding to an incident and someone thinks that I am not doing a good job? Or what happens if I get the call wrong? That means that's a cultural thing. Then it needs to say, hey, you know, in a we believe everyone is trying to do their best work. And sometimes everyone gets it wrong sometimes. So that's okay. This is the way we mitigate it. That's a healthy approach to stress. And so again, let's also not forget that this goes both ways, all right? I know that this uh, presentation kind of dealt with a lot of the negative on the side, but we can also think about happiness, you know, and, and positivity and positive well-being and job satisfaction. What structural factors can you do to contribute there as well? I think that's also really important to look at and maybe a little bit more fun. So in conclusion, yes, you can improve your team's well-being. Your well-being and mental health matter. You know, we can figure out how to intentionally create positive effects. Let's build systems that include humans. All right. And like I said, if you are an engineering manager and, you know, my co-founder and I are really interested and curious about how you approach your work, this is something that we're saying because we really think that there are just so many smart ideas out there and we want to bring them all together. Um, you know, reach out to me, email me at jamie at incident labs.io i'd be happy to chat about this stuff i love nerding i mean you can probably tell i love nerding about this stuff um thank you so much there's my email address again uh there's my personal twitter it's I, I sometimes talk about work stuff there but mostly it's beyonce and taco um and lastly we put out this zine it's a free zine on incident response if this is something you're interested in it's called the post incident review you'll find uh, there's articles and illustrations and you know we really want to put together uh post incident um reports there so that people can start learning from each other more uh it's there and it's for free so visit at zine.incidentlabs.io Thank you so much for listening and I'm so excited to hear your feedback and suggestions and comments and questions.